I think it was December of 2021, we actually decided to make the pivot and switch to uh, acquiring assets. So our first purchase was $100,000 single family house in North Adams, Massachusetts that we used as an Airbnb. And then since, you know, and then from there, we bought a two unit, a three unit, a five, an eight, a 10. And uh, back in June of last year, we closed on our largest acquisition, which was a, a $9 million purchase price of 40 townhouses on Cape Cod. And since then, we've acquired um, roughly, I think it's like 563 RV pads and roughly 133 apartments. Welcome to the Creating Wealth Podcast, where Kyle Curtin takes you on an extraordinary journey alongside renowned multifamily real estate experts from every corner of the United States. We teach you how to harness the power of real estate investing and witness the transformation of your wealth building strategy. Let's create wealth together. What's up, guys? Welcome to episode 149 of the Creating Wealth podcast. Today, we get the great pleasure of chatting with John Manser, co-owner of Archer Acquisitions, a real estate syndication company based out of Boston that specializes in multifamily and RV parks. John, what's going on, man? Super excited to have you on here, dude. I really appreciate you for uh, reaching out to me, Kyle, and uh, having me on your pod. Uh, episode 169? Uh, 149. Almost. Oh, 149. <laughs> you're crushing it. That's You're doing a great job. So I really appreciate you for uh, letting me on. Absolutely, man. I, I appreciate that a lot, man. It means a lot. It does. Um, so to kind of jump into things, dude, like I always, you know, leave it open to the guests, like where they want to start off, like in their career, like, like how they got into real estate, like if they want to share details before that, like childhood, like wherever you want to jump in, go nuts, <laughs> you know? <laughs> no, I appreciate it. So uh, pretty much, you know, Kyle gave a great uh, introduction. I co-own and I'm a partner of Archer Acquisitions. We specialize in multifamily and RV parks uh, in New England. But, you know, we started our real estate journey in real estate wholesaling uh, back in 2020, I believe. Um, and during that time, you know, we were having some really good success with wholesaling. We realized that it was some great active income, but we weren't actually creating or generating any kind of wealth for ourselves. Um, since then, I think it was December of 2021, we actually decided to make the pivot and switch to uh, acquiring assets. So our first purchase was $100,000 single family house in North Adams, Massachusetts that we used as an Airbnb. And then from there, we bought a two unit, a three unit, a five, an eight, a 10. And uh, back in June of last year, we closed on our largest acquisition, which was a, a $9 million purchase price of 40 townhouses on Cape Cod. And since then, we've acquired um, roughly, I think it's like 563 RV pads and roughly 133 apartments. Uh, we sold a 15 unit building that we had in Waterville, Maine. And then, but during that time, we stumbled into the world of RV parks. And RV parks are super, a super interesting asset class. And not that many people actually know about it. You, people typically bucket it with mobile home parks um, when in actuality they're completely different. We're actually one of two campground uh, companies that are rolling up RV parks throughout New England. Um, this other group based out of, I think they're based out of Quincy, Mass. But we pretty much stumbled into it because my business partner, Ben, at the time was riding his bike uh, through a couple rail trails in the back roads of like Fitchburg and Ashby mass mm -hmm. came across his RV park. He was so curious to see what it was. Cause you know, why are people, you know, are taking in tourism attractions in Ashby when there's not really anything to do around there rather than actually nothing, but um, <laughs> pretty much what ended up happening was he went up to them, asked them a couple questions, something along the lines of, you know, what is this place? 
what do you guys do? Um, kind of take a look around. And they were actually really open to having a conversation with him. But once he was, once he started asking questions about, uh, is it a good business? Would they ever sell? They freaked out. They were just like, you're trying to steal the park. We don't want to sell it. This brings in so much money. It's a cash cow. So of course, you know, this was back in, uh, I think it was like 2022. Yeah. 2022. Um, and you know, when he, when he heard cash cow, he was, they were, he was just like, Oh, I have to look into this a little bit more. Um, he started calling around a couple RV parks, two owners, you know, wanted to have a conversation with him. If he was real, he would come visit the park that day. Yeah. Next thing you know, he went to go visit the park, had a conversation. And we got really lucky because these owners were extremely meticulous about their campground and the operation. Everything was all, you know, everything was water, electric, you know, sewer hookups. There was no tenting sites. Everything was paved. It was actually like a, a pretty much a beautiful park. It was turnkey. Uh, so all we had to do was actually operate the park. And since we've never operated an RV park before, we actually moved into the RV park. Uh, me and my other business partner, Carl, we actually moved into the RV park to actually run it. Uh, wow. We were able to force the value actually a good amount the first year. We were able to bring the you know the gross revenue from I think four hundred twenty thousand to about seven hundred twenty within the within the first year, and the NOI went from like about one fifty to about. I think it was like 380. So it was a great time. Hell yeah. But that's a little <laughs> bit of a, 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 snip, a, a snapshot of um, how we kind of um, started in the space with wholesaling, then got into multifamily, as well as getting stumbling into RV parks. That's incredible, man. Absolutely. And especially like, I want to jump back a sec to like, you know, buying like the first couple assets. Like, did you have kind of that? Um, Kind of like that, like following like the path of progression, I guess, if you will, of like starting with the first single family, you know, the short term rental model. And then did you do, you know, like a refi or a HELOC or something or like sell that one to move on to the two and the three and the five and like kind of keep rolling or. Oh, yeah. So the way we actually bought that property, we weren't using any of our own money. We actually raised uh, debt from private private investors. Hell yeah. I think we did like 12 or 13% annualized and refinanced after the first, you know, eight to 12 months. And then but simultaneously, we were buying a three unit in Pittsfield, Mass. We bought it for like 90,000. And then about a year later, we refinanced at a value of 280. Um, and then, and then we also bought an eight unit in Gardner. Um, cause we actually knew Gardner mass really well because we were wholesaling a lot in that, in that market, but we bought an eight unit for like 400 or 390. Um, and then we were able to refinance that after 10 to 12 months. But, um, we, yeah, I would say like we progressed in terms of our deal size, but we've kind of have always been leveraging other people's money so that we can acquire the assets and, you know, provide a good return to our investors, as well as uh, create, you know, passive income, but also create some kind of wealth vehicle for them. And so that they can start uh, growing a portfolio as we're growing the portfolio as well. Absolutely, man. No, a hundred percent. And that's, that's a beautiful thing. I mean, especially, I guess, how was it? Yeah. You could say like as much as you want or, or as yeah. little as you want. It's, it's up to you. You know what I mean? But yeah. like bringing on, that first investor like was it one of those conversations where like you might have mentioned you know to to somebody like this is what i'm looking to do like this is you know what i've done so far previously like did they kind of approach you and be like all right like you know how like how can we work together type of thing mm -hmm. um i guess how did that like that first interaction with like the first private lender go down and again like it's up to you how much you want to share no yeah no of course you know I, <laughs> I, I appreciate the question i don't i don't want to just ramble on you know but uh yeah so i honestly the the first couple conversations between myself and my three business partners we have our own personal networks of you know friends and family that have always been interested in investing in real estate but they always you know, it's the same story that goes on. Everyone thinks they can't get into real estate because it costs too much. When in actuality, 
you pool investors together, you know, um, you're able to buy an asset and they own a specific percentage. But the first conversation for myself was actually with a buddy of mine that I met at, at Bentley, um, you know, back between 2014, 2018 His name's Greg. He actually uh, joined our team recently, almost about six or seven months ago, but he had actually been passively investing in real estate for a decent amount of time. And when I told him about this opportunity, he was just like, you know, a good way I could, that I can earn 13% of my money. I don't really have any other opportunities right now. So let's do it. Hell yeah. um, and so it was, it was, it was actually pretty, pretty, uh, pretty simple, but now the thing is like the way we scaled our portfolio was leveraging our, uh, I guess, relationships with active, active sponsors, as well as active investors that have been in the space for a longer time, kind of doing what we're slowly getting into. And we leverage relationships like Nick Allerud with a real estate, um, and a couple other, uh, you know, investors that we know very, very well. And the way that we were able to, you know, instead of just getting an assignment fee after finding the deal, we started asking for equity and, you know, started asking for uh, actual responsibilities. And we realized that we actually liked operating uh, these larger assets um, while we were still, you know, picking up the, the single family, the three unit, the four unit, the five unit, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, we were able to really just, you know, leverage our relationship. You know, people were super, um, you know, uh, approached with open arms of, you know, having us be a co-sponsor and that's how we were able to buy pretty much $40 million of assets in less than two years. And we have an additional, uh, you know, $25 million of assets under, under contract right now that we're looking to purchase, you know, uh, you know, one portfolio with Andrew free, as you know. Absolutely, man. That's incredibly cool, John. Holy crap, man. Wow. I love that. And especially like, yeah, I mean, going from again, man, like going from that first single family and like scaling up, you know, in, in different ways and especially tying in, um, you know, quickly, you know, making your way into the commercial space where obviously the valuation is is determined, you know, not by the comps in the residential world, but by, you know, net operating income and, and such. Mm -hmm. And especially too, man, like, you know, tying in the, uh, the RV parks and that kind of thing. I've had, there was a couple of folks that I interviewed on the show more like last year, um, that were into, you know, some of those kind of assets and it, it's definitely incredibly fascinating. Um, I mean, for a lot of fascinating to me for a lot of different reasons, I mean, but one of those being like a lot of different ways that you can monetize within, you know, the the normal, I guess, numbers, if you will, um, yeah. you know, on, on the asset. Um, and it's just, it's such an incredibly cool thing, man, you know, and are you guys buying the RV parks like locally to new England or, you know, kind of spreading your wings in different areas or. Yeah. So we're, so pretty much I, to piggyback on your point, like we really like RV parks because again, it's for, I would say two or three different reasons. One, none of the guests that are in your parks are classified as tenants. So if they don't yeah. follow the rules, non-payment, I can if I have a good relationship with the local police department, you know, you can kick them out within 30 minutes, you know. Yep. Uh, with as you know, with multifamily in mass, <laughs> very, very hard, you know. <laughs> so uh we realize, you know. Once we realized this, then we kind of just started full steam ahead because the returns are much higher, but they are like they're class. I would say that they're classified as a boring business. You know, they're not really I wouldn't say that they're they're not your standard multifamily, your self storage, your retail, your commercial, your office, so on and so forth. It's an alternative asset that's very that's somewhat complex to understand, as well as it's a, it's a lot more management intensive. Even though you, if you're buying a park with staff already in place, you have to manage those those people. You have to make sure that you know they're they're actually adding value to the park. That they're not they're just looking for a paycheck. You want to make sure that they actually like being in the hospitality space because that's what we're in. You know, we're in the hospitality space because we're providing the the facility, 
but people are bringing their rooms. Yeah. And the thing is, like, uh, the rates that you're getting for RV parks are so much higher compared to mobile home parks. And people are leaving their homes as well as leaving their apartments because it's an alternative uh it's like an alternative housing option but again they can't live there they can't claim residency they can't uh send their kids to the school system and the second reason uh you know why we liked rv parks is that pretty much the first reason was that there's multiple ways to like monetize it actually no first reason was that the people aren't tenants second reason is that there's multiple there's multiple revenue drivers. You know, you have your, you have different rates for the length of stay. You have your nightly, your weekly, your monthly. You have something called the seasonal rate, which if you want to stay with me for my summer season, that's typically between mo- months, you know, May and October. Um, that's going to be one rate. It's going to be much more discounted, but then the income is more forecastable. But then you also have, uh, electric bill back. So if they're staying there for the season, then typically they're responsible for their electricity usage. The electricity is actually in you in the campground's name, but we go around, read the meters every month, and then bill them for their usage. So that you're really driving down your opex, as well as you know for propane. When you're doing propane fills, you know you're getting propane at like a dollar sixty to a dollar eighty today. And you can sell them to your guests for somewhere between 315, 320, 340. And then also you have your store revenue, you have your pump out revenue, which is where you're pumping out, you know, uh, septic tanks of RVs that are on sites that don't have a sewer hookup. And then gotcha. there are guest fees, there's pet fees, there's, you know, overnight guests, there's day get, there's just so many other fees associated with these parks. They're really driving up, you know, your income rather than your standard multifamily where you're just collecting rent and that's it. Yeah. I think it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Sorry. To answer your (laughs) next question uh, was uh, we are actually, yeah, we're really focused on New England. We're buying in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Connecticut. Um, We've looked at like we have a property under contract in New Jersey for an RV park. Um, but we have a side person sale yet. Um, and we are actually looking at things in Maine, Rhode Island. Uh, we haven't touched, you know, Vermont for, for some reasons, actually, I'm not the best to talk about those reasons, but, and then we haven't looked at New York yet, but yeah, we're actually looking in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Connecticut, Maine, uh, Rhode Island. So if you know anyone that has, you know, send them my way. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. hundred percent, man. Yeah. It's, it's incredibly cool, man. And um, yeah, it's just incredibly fascinating. <laughs> so is yeah. that, um, I guess I know that you guys are definitely doing some multi stuff as well Is I mm-hmm. guess, are those kind of like the two, two things that you're like really honing in on is like the yeah. family and the RV, you know, kind of uh, acquisition, I guess, if you will. Yeah, so you know we're we're primarily targeting multifamily and RV parks. You know, we used to really cast a wide net for multifamily. We were looking in you know northern central Maine, Waterville. We were looking in you know uh, Gorham, New Hampshire. We were looking all the way in Pittsfield, Mass. But since then, we've really narrowed down where we're looking for multis. Literally, uh, Worcester County and anything east of Worcester County. Uh, trying to, you know, purchase somewhere between 20 and 70 unit apartment complexes or scattered site portfolios. Um, you know, the reason why we like scattered site portfolios is because not that many people actually want them because it's not a sexy brick building. It's not a sexy, you know, uh, garden style apartment complex, but since it's not sexy, the returns are, you know, higher. Yeah. Again, you can't go around and brag to your friends that, you know, saying like, hey, I just invested into this because it's, you know, a scatter site portfolio. It just looks like a duplex. If you just look at one photo <laughs> of the portfolio. But if yeah. you're, you know, investing into uh, a garden style apartment complex in Waltham or Newton, you know, sure, it's much prettier, but your returns are, you know, 
a lot Nothing. smaller. Yeah, you're really yeah. just hoping for the appreciation and there's no cash flow whatsoever. Yeah. And then RV parks, yeah, we're just you can't really focus on like one territory because then you would you'd be you would be your own competitor. And sure it's good to like it's good to purchase RV parks, you know, kind of close together because there are synergies. Like for instance, we own one RV park in Tingsboro, Mass, and then we own one in Brookline, New Hampshire. So the one in Tingsboro is 24 sites with two single family houses. And then you have the one in Brookline, which is 54 sites, but they're about 25 to a 30 minute drive from each other. And the reason why they're really synergistic is because one, you can have one person overseeing both parks as well um, as huh. you can feed demand, demand and supply with each park. So let's say if the 24 pad RV park is full, you just play, Hey, we own one actually 25 minutes away. It's in Brookline, similar rates, um, and you can go stay at that park. And most of the time, people are willing to stay at that park because they're so close by. Yeah. You know? That's incredibly interesting, man, how there's there's that dynamic of like not wanting to be your own competitor, but also at the same time being able to, you know, have a lot of synergy and being able to, you know, I guess have a lot of power because you have, you know, a bigger you know, surface area options, like that type of thing, mm -hmm. um, relatively close by. That's incredibly interesting. Yeah. I do think that like, if we were able to like, if we found a park that was dilapidated and it just had really good demand, um, and it was next to like a really high end park, what we'd probably end up doing by the high end park and by the one that's a little bit more dilapidated and make, you know, one much more expensive. And then one more of a like you just more, more like, affordable option yeah. for those for those guests. But that's the only way that those two can act like like buying parks next to each other can actually work. Rather than if they're both the same quality, then you're really kind of stealing demand if it's like a 15 minute drive. Yeah. You know? And if they're both large parks, if they're small parks, then I think it's okay to do that because again. A smaller park is much easier to fill rather than a 200 site RV park where there's a lot more turnover. Yeah, that's wild, man. That makes a lot of sense. That's such yeah. a, a crazy animal. That's that's definitely not, you know, in the multifamily sector. Yeah, I would say like <laughs> I think anyone that's looking to get into it, they're going to have a little bit of an issue. For two reasons like if you're like if you're an active investor and you're trying to buy an rv park you know in western massachusetts and you live in waltham yep um and you're looking to buy your first rv park and you want to be more of an absentee owner mo and you're like you're trying to balance all your other assets if you don't have experience actually managing a park or if you're not willing to move to that park for the first year or two and run it yourself it's going to be hard to get financing and insurance. Ah. So insurance has been tightening up for a multitude of reasons, but the insurance companies want to make sure that the owners actually have experience running these parks rather than just some person that's going to look at it from a spreadsheet and say, it should look like this. When in actuality, as we all know, you know, spreadsheets are only as good as like your actual knowledge of the space. If you don't know anything, you can make anything look good on paper. It's just more about actually having legitimate reasoning behind it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, man. I mean, especially in a, you know, kind of an economic climate like we're in now, where I feel like the strength of the asset manager is is really stronger than ever. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and things generally are, you know, kind of a lot tighter and, and that kind of thing. That makes a lot of sense. You know, and like, because to your point, man, like it's, you know, it's complete hospitality. Like there's like this business, um, you know, it's, it's definitely not as simple as like, oh, just turn the unit, throw somebody in there. That's, you know, looks pretty solid, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, and lease it up, yeah. you know, it's like, there's this whole other component of, you know, this like entrepreneurial, you know, business owner, like operations, like super crazy, like not mm -hmm. that multifamily doesn't have that, but like, I feel like there's a lot more pieces that um you know have to be moving in the right direction and and that kind of thing yeah exactly like a few of the other things that people you know you have to realize that like when you're doing like your multi-family typically when you're getting like property insurance you're really getting like 
you're getting insurance to replace the asset if anything were to happen to it. But sure, you may have like general liability, but now your general liability is on a whole different scale with RV parks. Cause let's say you have 200 pads Let's say each site has three people on it. You have a, you have children running around the park. There sometimes are hazards. So you have to make sure you have the correct signage. You have to make sure that you actually have people that are watching over. You have people consuming alcohol on your premises that can wander around the park. So it's just like a lot of things can go wrong and you have to make sure you really have the, the processes in place to deal with any kind of uh, challenge that arises. And the reason why we like buying RV parks in New England, you know, another reason is because again, like we're one of two people and we have the ability to drive to each park, you know, within like a two to three hour period. Like all my parks are with, within three hours from me right now. So if we were, if anything were to happen and let's say my three other business partners couldn't actually go to the parks to handle any situation that needed us to be there, then, um, you know, I, I'd be able to go or vice versa, depending on, you know, whoever else can go. But yeah, so we really want to make sure that we're actually close by because if we're not a lot more things can go wrong and you, and you really need to protect the asset. You need to protect the business as well as you need to protect the investor's capital. Yeah. I, I think it makes a lot of sense, man. You know, mm -hmm. especially from that, uh, you know, operational type of perspective, like, do you ever go by like, like once a year or like a couple times a year or something for, you know, like a surprise, like inspection or anything, or like just kind of when, when needs mm -hmm. arise. Oh, well, my, my, I think my business partner, Alex is pretty much at each park once a week. Gotcha. Once, every, once you know, I think, or once to four, like right now, like, uh, for two of the parks that we purchased, um, he's been there probably about two times this week and it's only, gotcha. it's only Wednesday. So <laughs> he's very like he he's driving all over the place. Um, good thing he has a he has a he has a car that gets good gas mileage. And yeah, pick up truck. But um, yeah, so I just really think that that yeah. So we do go to these parks a lot, and we have like a lot of we have a lot of like resources that you know can be. Uh, we have eyes on the property, so we have cameras set up at every every single property, so we actually can easily go on our phone to check in on things. Hell yeah. Yeah, yeah man. That's it's awesome, dude. That's wicked cool. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> John, I, I know we could definitely keep talking about this for a very long time, man, but I very, very much appreciate you coming on here, man. It's uh this was absolutely awesome, man. I do really appreciate the you know you making time and inviting me onto the podcast. And uh yeah man pretty much yeah if anyone wants to get in touch with us, you know I just gotta do my little marketing. Go to uh, Archer, archeracq.com or uh, you can book a call with me there or you can you know, send me an email at john at archerbuys.com as well as find me on LinkedIn, John Mansour. Yeah, man. Well, right. again, appreciate it so much. I hope you have a great rest of your evening and uh, I hope you have a stellar week. You as well, my man. We'll talk soon, John. Thank we'll you talk. so much. Right. Thanks. Bye. Bye. That's a wrap for today's episode. We want to thank you for being a valued listener of the Creating Wealth Podcast. Make sure to visit www.creatingwealth.com to connect with us. Dive into our ever-expanding library of informative blogs and explore a wide range of additional valuable resources. Stay tuned for our next episode as we continue to create wealth together.